Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is Gregory Singer. I'm the artist, fortunate enough to be featured at the lovely and prestigious art gallery uh, of Sharon Weiss in Columbus, Ohio. I'm very fortunate to be the artist selected for this month's presentations. And I have made a little brochure, a little video type brochure, showing a few of my pieces of art and, and a little bit what was going on in my mind or what, how I approached the work, what was um, uh, important to me in regard to how I uh, create some of my artwork. It's not very long, it's only a few pieces of art, but I just wanted to say hello and uh, wish you all the best October with pumpkins and the lovely fall weather. Uh, it's, a, it's part of our life now, it's getting cooler and, and uh, quite nice, a, a good time to go indoors and look at the artwork and hear music and study languages and prepare for the, the lovely holiday season coming up soon. So anyway, uh, from New York City, Gregory Singer here. I want to thank Mark Carr for introducing me to Sharon Weiss and her lovely gal gallery there and uh, hope to meet you all someday and perhaps you'll like uh, some of the artwork that I've done and you might want to take it home with you. So I wish you all the best. Have a lovely October. Because the architecture is so ugly in America, I tend to draw pictures of Europe and of the 19th century. Horses and buggies and people with nice top hats and wool and, and nice clothing, cotton. It seemed like a, a, a more genteel era. So I flatter myself when I lived in France many years ago when I was younger, and I drew many pictures of Paris, and I lived the bohemian life. It was quite an adventure. It sort of affected me, and I sort of flatter myself that I experienced the same kind of excitement that the 19th century great artists of, of Paris experienced also, and that somehow it rubbed off on me, and my hand, when I draw art, is a little bit similar, to, uh, has felt the same inspirations and, and excitement that was felt in Paris in the 19th century. I did enjoy creating this work. It's a tabletop with uh, many different colorful items and textures on it. The glass or the copper, uh, the plants, fruit, peaches, grapes. An artist would enjoy this kind of uh, tabletop uh, image because of the different colors and textures. Uh, I also had a, a woman's face in the back of the table, but I took it out at one point. Uh, people asked me, why is there a face? Why is there a woman's face there? And uh, of course, portraits are very sensitive because people like the face or they don't like the face, uh, the expression on the face. So it can be a little bit controversial. And I ended up taking out that particular face and now there's simply a blank wall behind the table. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, I noticed a lot of the artists in the 19th century drew pictures of tables and chairs and plants and curtains and windowsills, and I realized why. Many times an artist has a great urge to put something down on paper, to draw something, to capture something. And if an artist was poor, didn't have the money to take a trolley car or a or a, a, a subway or a train somewhere and couldn't uh, go out and have a drink or food or entertain friends. They were many times left at home. Maybe the weather was bad. So what did they do? They drew a picture of a chair or of a table or perhaps a sink or the curtains. And that's what's so amusing. I had that experience myself and many times with the urge to draw something, I couldn't think of something or I wanted something to, to copy. So I drew a picture of my chair or of the windowsill. And then I realized I was doing something that the 19th century artists were doing because they couldn't afford to go out on the town and draw pictures. So they drew what they had in front of them. And that's why I realized they didn't have a great obsession with chairs. There was nothing else to draw. I was enjoying very much capturing the little shininess on the copper kettle or the light reflecting on the bottle and that's a, a shadows and things like that are a lot of fun for an artist to capture. It gives a certain three-dimensional aspect of the, of the drawing. I'm very fond of this one, and I hope you like it. This one is called The Youthful Quartet with Spectator. To capture a string quartet properly takes a lot of work. There's so many curves in the instruments themselves and the four musicians that are sitting close together 
to try to capture every inch of the instruments and their arms and, and wrists and fingers and then to put the noses and mouths and everything in the right place is not easy. It's quite a challenge to the artist. Um, also, it should be noted that a lot of the classical musicians playing string quartets uh, may look like they're in some sort of pain, like they have a stomach ache or a pebble in their shoe perhaps. But no, usually it's a result of the fact that they're concentrating so hard or they feel very passionate about the music. And when four musicians can play and move and sound like one, it's quite an exhilarating experience. And they're not uh, in any kind of pain, but they're actually enjoying it. it. It made me wonder as a kid when I was playing in symphony orchestras and I see 80, 90 musicians of various instruments like brass instruments and violins and, and woodwind instruments playing together and making such harmony that somehow it could be a microcosm of our culture, or our civilization, that, that people can work and live together and, and have a much more wonderful, fruitful existence. And I hope the symphony orchestra could be a good model of cooperation and, and working together. I do like this picture. I think it came out quite well. I hope you enjoy it. Cat obsession is kind of interesting if you look at it carefully. Certainly at first there's not too much in the picture. There's a cat sitting on a chair looking at a goldfish. But if you begin to study a little bit the reality of the person who lives in that apartment, you might think that, first of all, there's something kind of lonely about it. There's one plate on the table, so the person's not expecting company. No friends or guests coming over that night. The occupant of the apartment is not home, probably at work. The cat is bored and just staring at the fish. The old-fashioned window uh, has not been replaced by modern-day uh, windows that are supposed to be better for the keeping the heat in or the cold out. It's an old-fashioned window with one pane of glass. And, of course... It looks like the apartment's pretty high up in the air, which may be unrealistic to the general feel of the room. So that I cannot explain, but um, the city doesn't look very interesting out the window. There's very sort of monotone little square windows, nothing too exciting going on in the view. And of course, the parquet floors, which I do add to many of my pictures. Um, parquet floors are certainly very common in New York City in the pre-war uh, era buildings. And so you'll notice a lot of my artwork has parquet floors. And in the future, if I become a famous artist and someone can see a picture with lots of parquet floors or such windows or a little bit 19th century looking, they'll say, oh, that's a Gregory Singer. Certain subjects, certain motifs I use quite often, and that's many times a cat looking into the picture or a music stand, or a musical instrument, or parquet floors. So you can start to notice a little bit of that style of subject, at least, and the uh, rendering of such a subject. So I hope you like this one. I, th I find it kind of peaceful, a little bit lonely, and uh, but it's got a nice feel to it as far as I'm concerned, and I hope you enjoy it. Bryant Park, decades ago is the name of this one, which I enjoyed drawing. It's not exact in regard to perspective. In fact, the policeman in the background is quite large. He should be a little smaller. He's further away, unless he's a very huge person. And a lot of the men in front of the picture look similar. It's almost like the same person is reproduced in different poses. They seem all to have a cigarette in their mouth and the same style hat. Um, and the fountain itself should probably be larger, but it wouldn't fit into the picture if it was too much larger. Um, so there's something called poetic license. And in this regard, when an artist is drawing, the artist can make something larger or smaller uh, at their own whim or by mistake. And though this picture is not perfect, it is Bryant Park in New York City, uh, which is 42nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue. I do frequent the park quite often. Uh, soon they'll be tearing up the grass and putting in ice for the ice skating rink for the uh, fall and winter season. And I certainly have fond memories of being in the park this summer. Uh, beautiful 
green grass and many people sitting around, tourists visiting, and uh, it's really a beautiful park behind the library. Uh, and then in the winter will be an ice skating rink with Christmas music and happy couples uh, and children skating around the rink. It's a very nice time of year to enjoy this. And so this Bryant Park picture is, is one of my favorites, and I enjoyed it very much. I hope you, hope you like it. Sometimes a picture just evolves on its own, and uh, I give it a title or a story to it later, or I add an object which seems to give it a certain purpose or meaning. In this case, I don't remember exactly when I put the clock in, but the idea was to have him taking a drink at 12 o'clock midnight. I don't know whether it's New Year's Eve and he's celebrating on his own, whether he's off duty at 12 o'clock, decided to finish someone else's drink, or just to have a little nip himself at this point. Um, I think the novelty of this attempt on my part was the idea of drawing a picture of the glass tilting with the contents, the wine, going into someone's mouth. Uh, technically, again, a lot of my drawings are just sketches to sort of experiment with the technique of trying to convey a certain action. And it came out a little cartoon-like, but I do like it. It's kind of pleasant and uh, rather cheerful in its own way. And it, it sort of seems to explain itself. One can add their own interpretation to it. It's uh, kind of a fun picture. I hope you enjoy it. This picture depicts Fifth Avenue looking downtown at Washington Square Park. I figure it's the late 1920s, early, maybe early, early 1930, because there's no taller buildings on the other side of Washington Square Park. So I, I'm assuming it's late 20s, early 30s. It just turned out that way. And I wanted to push the idea of Empire State Building and other famous monuments in New York City for tourists, but it would not have been realistic. The Empire State Building is not south of Washington Square Park, and I believe the Empire State Building was built in 1931, uh, 1932, somewhere around there. So I figured this must be late 1920s, and it just evolved that way. Uh, I like the people on the corners. Fifth Avenue should be a little wider than it is in this picture. And the tire's a little bit crooked on the on the car, but it's it seems to give it a little bit of character I kind of like. So this is a, a nice picture, I believe. It's, again, sort of an, years ago, I portray things always in the past for some reason. It seems more romantic those days when, when men wore hats, etc. So I don't know. That's the way it turned out. I hope you enjoy it. Papa Bull is a character in a movie depicting 1944 Germany, um, the French resistance against the Nazi occupation of Paris. And Papa Bull was a trainman. He ran the locomotives and he was very brave and he was part of the French resistance. And uh, during a very dramatic scene, he was accused and threatened and captured by the by the Nazis and Bert Lancaster was begging for his life to spare him uh, to no avail and the Germans machine gunned Papa Bull to his death but uh, he was a great great patriot and a great resistance fighter against the Nazis and the movie was made in 1964 and it's a, it's a really terrific movie. It's in black and white. It's called The Train. And this picture is, a, is my attempt to depict Papa Bull, the train man who was executed by the Nazis.